Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure to me for introducing uh, this first uh, plenary global trade in the 21st century. I would like you to welcome uh, with a great applause the Secretary General of the International Chamber of Commerce, John Danilovic. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor to be here today as the Secretary General of the International Chamber of Commerce to open the first plenary session of the Ninth World Chambers of Commerce. The World Chambers Federation is a core part of the International Chamber of Commerce. And as was clear from the remarks made this morning by Terry McGraw and Peter Mihawk, the work of the World Chambers Federation is central to the ICC's mission to promote peace and prosperity through world trade. Trade is the engine of, global, of the global economy and a central driver of economic growth, jobs, and development. And we all, therefore, have an interest in ensuring that there is a strong international trade agenda. It's vital that Chambers of Commerce engage in the development of trade policy to ensure that ongoing negotiators deliver real gains for companies large and small. Today's opening plenary will take a look at some of the key elements of major ongoing talks in the World Trade Organization and also at the regional level. We have, without doubt, one of the most robust international trade agendas that we've had in decades. The challenge we faced is to turn the potential of a number of ongoing talks and processes into real world results. This is particularly true of the recently agreed world trade, of the recently agreed trade facilitation agreement, a deal which, if implemented, would significantly simplify global trade by streaming customs regulations and cutting red tape at borders. Making trade easier for companies across the world and enabling many SMEs to enter the global market for the first time. We need your support to get the trade facilitation agreement implemented in the quickest possible time. Just a handful of countries have ratified this agreement to date. Chambers can play a vitally important role in speeding this process. You can help policymakers understand that this deal will help exporters extend their global reach and spur local economic growth. And this, of course, also applies to many of the other ongoing trade talks you'll hear about this morning. No doubt today's discussion will provide an important reference point for your future engagement with companies and governments. To guide the discussion today, we're delighted to be able to draw on the broad expertise and experience of Jim Backus a truly world citizen, but from Orlando, Florida. And I understand that we have representatives from Orlando here today. Didn't expect to get a round of applause on that one, Jim. Jim is the chairman of the International Chamber of Commerce's Commission on Trade and Investment and a well-respected trade lawyer. He's a former U.S. Congressman and also served as chairman of the WTO's Dispute Settlement Appeals Body. Jim, over to you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much, uh, John, and, and thank you all. We'll, we're going to keep this informal, and our goal uh, of this first panel is uh, uh, to say what we have to say and then give you in the audience a chance to uh, say what you'd like to say and ask whatever questions you uh, may have. Uh, it, it is true that I, I am from Orlando, Florida, and I'm proud of it. Uh, although I spend most of my life on an airplane, as I think many of us do. Uh, and uh, on those airplanes, uh, I'm able to see a lot of what's happening in trade in the 21st century, which is our topic today. But uh, it uh, strikes me that uh, although we're here to talk about the 21st century, uh, there remain some things uh, that have been said in other centuries that continue to uh, 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 instruct us today. Uh, I would be remiss if I did not applaud our host from the Torino Chamber for reminding us of the important connection between trade and peace. It was uh, in 1919 that the International Chamber of Commerce was founded. 
we uh, have always had as our watchword that we are merchants of peace. And we follow the watchword, too, of uh, a 19th century thinker, uh, a Frenchman named Frederick Bastiat, who famously said that uh, um, if goods don't cross borders, then soldiers will. Uh, trade is all about peace and about bringing the world together peacefully through commerce. We must never forget that. The reason we founded the GATT, which has become the WTO after World War II, was to avoid World War III. Uh, that's one thinker from another uh, century we might recall. Uh, in the 18th century, uh, there was uh, still another thinker, I think, who is relevant to everything we're going to say this morning in this particular uh, session. Uh, trade is uh, nothing other than a division of labor. Uh, international trade is a division of labor that happens to cross uh, these invisible boundaries that we've invented called national borders. Adam Smith in the 18th century, equally famously, uh, told us that the uh, division of labor is uh, limited only by the extent of the marketplace. What we've learned here in the 21st century and what we'll be discussing this morning is that uh, the extent of the marketplace is uh, now truly worldwide. Uh, we have witnessed the death of distance. Now we have, uh, in reality, uh, not goods that come from somewhere but goods that come from everywhere. And increasingly, as Terry has already told us today, uh, we uh, see uh, goods exceeded by services and services embedded in goods in all kinds of new ways. This happens as part of global value chains that are increasingly affected by and affect digital trade, transport in all kinds of, of ways, uh, that bump up against all kinds of sustainability issues that are economic issues above all else. These are the topics of a 21st century trade agenda, and these are some of the reasons why in the ICC we're putting forward a world trade and investment agenda for the 21st century, something that can grapple with uh, not what the world used to be, but what it is, what it's becoming, and what we think it could be if we continue to be, as we must, merchants of peace. All that said, uh, I have uh, assembled beside me here uh, an array of talent from all over the world. Uh, I am not going to pause uh, to consider at length uh, their uh, uh, impressive resumes. They'll forgive me for that. They've all said, let's uh, each make some brief presentations and then open it up for a lively exchange from the floor. Uh, we're going to uh, recognize each in turn for up to seven minutes. If they uh, take fewer than seven, I'm willing to forgive them. And we'll, we'll go right down the row here with each of our various experts. And then after we've finished, uh, then uh, will be recognizing you for any questions you may have. If you don't have any, I perhaps will have a few. Sitting next to me is uh, a very distinguished gentleman who has for uh, a number of years been among the leading trade uh, diplomats in the world. Uh, we're former colleagues uh, from Geneva. Uh, he's from Nigeria, but he now serves the entire world as Deputy Director General of the World Trade Organization, Frederick Aga. Fred, what is the WTO doing now? What is at the top of the agenda? And most of all, most important, how can we in the global business community help? Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Jim. Uh, let me start first by thanking Terry for the kind words he said about the WTO and my director general, my boss, DDG, DG Azvedo, during the opening session. Uh, it was very kind of you. Uh, I think to understand what we are doing in the WTO and what's, how you can help us, I think we need to 
reflect on what came up during the opening session today. The new uh, international trade landscape, which is focused mostly on global value chains, the intertwined issues of global value chains and trade facilitation. Uh, we all know that most of what you do now involves either simple transformation or complex transformation of products and trade across borders. Many of our, our countries have used these methods uh, for industrialization and their integration into the global economy for development. However, participation in these global value chains is not automatic, as you would all know. It requires reforms across the borders. It requires issues relating to trade finance, infrastructure, ports and customs procedures, largely because participation in global value chains is about competitiveness. And so, uh, for us in the WTO, we think the first co major contribution we have made is the agreement on trade facilitation. The agreement, the work on the agreement is now finished in Geneva, is back in capitals. And you know in our capitals, there are different processes towards ratification. So we will need you as the business community to help us uh, speak to your legislators to make sure that this is done. I know in some countries, uh, legislative action on ratification of agreements may not be necessary, but we still think you can help and contribute by putting your voice with the relevant authorities in your countries. The next uh, issue that I would want to focus on is our forthcoming ministerial conference in Nairobi, Kenya, in December this year. There's not much I can say, because you all know the challenges we face with the negotiating arm of the, our organization. Uh, it's been 14 years since the Doha round was launched. We made some little progress here and there, including the new agreement on trade facilitation, but major challenges still remain on agriculture NAMA and services. And I know that all these issues which are important to you, important to your business, would need to be resolved. So here again, uh, we will appeal that you support the negotiations by becoming engaged within the trade policy governance structures in your various countries. So you make the right inputs to help us uh, come up with a better work program to be approved by the ministers in Nairobi that will help us successfully conclude the round. I think the most important thing, uh, speaking to a forum like this, uh, one would need to say, look, WTO is now celebrating uh, its 20th anniversary. Uh, we are not talking of the GATT era, we are talking of 1995 when we became the new a World Trade Organization. Many of you see us largely from the problems we had with negotiations, and therefore you perceive us as bad. Many of you forget the domestic challenges, policy challenges you have in your economies, and you see the reform in the WTO as part of your problems. I think uh, that's not quite true, because in the organization's work, we have been very good with policy monitoring and surveillance, which helps the governments to keep their markets open, to be transparent in their policies, which I think all help your business. We have also been very uh, successful with the dispute settlement process. Uh, today, we have many cases, almost 494 requests, I'm sure one of your members is a good participant in our dispute settlement process and can attest to how efficient it has been. So that has been a success story. You talk of peace, if you have a dispute settlement process that enables the members to sort out their differences, I'm sure that uh, makes good case for 
piece. We're also looking at uh, monitoring of trade finance flows. You know that since the 19, uh, 2008 financial crisis, this has been a major issue. And the WTO has been working with the World Bank and the regional development banks and other major financial institutions to, begin to see how best uh, businesses, particularly SMEs, can be supported in their trade. We are also on accessions, and this is also a success story. We are now 161 members following the accession of Seychelles. And you know that during this period, we have also had China and Russia as major economies. We've had small, small uh, countries, including uh, uh, Samoa, which are very small economies. Importantly, also, within the WTO, you have the Aid for Trade uh, in, uh, Initiative. Uh, the global review is coming up uh, in, uh, from 30th June to 2nd July this year. I'm sure some of you would be taking part and showcasing your successful case stories. But also within the Aid for Trade Initiative, uh, you will appreciate the fact that we have the integrated uh, the enhanced integrated framework, which is helping uh, LDCs, uh, uh, LDCs to integrate into the international trading system through capacity building initiatives and projects that address their supply side uh, constraints. Uh, this is something that we think is of interest to you. I know that some of you are already working with the EIF on projects in your countries, and I hope you will continue to do that. So uh, to conclude, I think uh, we need to see the EIF uh, in the broader context of the aid for trade, and uh, the WTO has in that context also been working with key partners uh, like the ITC, uh, we have uh, Arancha Gonzalez here with us, the OECD, the World Bank, the regional development banks and UNCTAD in trying to do all these things that will help you better participate in international trade. I thank you. Thank you so much, Fred. Uh, any one of the points he made would be worthy of an entire session on its own. If, if I may, I'll take the liberty simply of underscoring as a segue to our next speaker, one of the points he made. On the trade facilitation agreement, we're quite proud of the role the ICC played leading up to Bali and, and getting that agreement finally concluded. But we now need 100 more countries to ratify it. Uh, and uh, they are counting on the business community again to come uh, together and help make that happen. The stakes are enormous. The Peterson Institute in Washington uh, estimates that full implementation of the trade facilitation agreement worldwide could contribute up to one trillion dollars annually in additional growth to the global economy, most of it in developing countries. Those are the stakes. Um, the key figure for the ICC and the success we had in Bali and in many of the other successes we've had in trade is our chairman, Terry McGraw, You've already had a chance to hear some from Terry this morning. Uh, uh, we want to hear more from him now. Uh, Terry, what more would you like to say about uh, the business agenda uh, for uh, the 21st century in trade and, and what we have done and what we need to do now? Okay. Well, first of all, thank you, Jim, and, uh, and I really echo your comments up front. Uh, and, you know, as the world is getting stronger and uh, more advanced uh, across the board, uh, trade becomes a critical factor uh, for the growth and jobs that we've talked about. Uh, and, and I can't think of a, a better and more important issue uh, than that. You brought it up that uh, if it's not, uh, you know, trading goods, uh, and, you know, it's uh, soldiers crossing borders. And you're so exactly right. And uh, uh, we've come a long way but we've got so much further to go uh, in, in all that. Um, I, uh, um, and I also look forward to the format of, of, of interaction and all of that, and so I'll be very brief. 
Uh, by the way, uh, you know, to your point, uh, you know, the uh, World Trade Organization uh, has made monumental steps in terms of really being much more active and aggressive uh, in helping this. One of the things that we have talked about from a country to country standpoint in doing free trade agreements is that even though you're negotiating from one country standpoint with another country uh, you know, on that one, everything should go through the WTO. Uh, and, you know, it is a, um, it is a centering body uh, that can initiate best practices, uh, help in the negotiation process, uh, alleviate some of the concerns and all of those things. So using the WTO aggressively uh, is very important. Uh, on your point, uh, Jim, on trade facilitation, uh, and I would just, um, uh, you know, uh, repeat the same thing. We need everybody's help here. Uh, in 2015, uh, we need two-thirds of the 160 uh, uh, that make up the WTO uh, to ratify, uh, you know, the uh, trade facilitation agreement. Uh, and, and the fact that we've got the trade facilitation agreement uh, is unique uh, in, in all of that, but we need to ratify it. And here's where I push back in terms of the business world. Business leaders need to work with government all the time in terms of policy and especially in trade to get these things done. In some cases, there are countries where government is here and business is subordinated. Uh, that doesn't work. Uh, that creates win-lose uh, environments, and everything that we've got to be about is creating win-win environments. And unfortunately, if you're in one of those situations, it has got to be the business leaders that push uh, and, and, and are aggressive uh, in terms of uh, developing the business-government relations because government, as we know, sets policy, but it's business that implements and executes on that policy. And therefore, we need to get uh, the business-government relationship uh, there. From a trade standpoint, uh, when we talked about the growth and the jobs and all of that, uh, that's where it's at. Uh, and, you know, and, and trade can do this. And, and by the way, I would like to say that this has come on very quickly uh, and that we've made a lot of progress and we're far down the road. We're not uh, on this part. You know, this was slow. Uh, when we were talking earlier about the advanced economies being such a large percentage of world GDP, they didn't care about trading uh, with other countries and the like. Today, as the world has grown up and it's much more broader, you know, trade is a critical element for economic growth and job creation, and we've got to get behind it. And I, I'm sad to say that even in, our, in my own country, the United States, we are slow uh, in terms of developing these kinds of deals. And let me give you an example. Um, uh, Ambassador Bob Zellick uh, in, in the early 2000s uh, was pushing aggressively uh, with our government about expansion of uh, economic development south of the border. Uh, I think. We do very little uh, in the African uh, uh, communities. We do very little in the South American uh, uh, communities. And therefore, we had to start to open it up uh, in, in all that. Well, I'm, I'm pleased to say that, uh, you know, with the Central American Free Trade Agreement, with the U.S.-Chile uh, uh, Free Trade Agreement, with the Colombia Trade Agreement, with the Peru Trade Agreement, uh, and so forth, uh, we were able to push. But the notion was, right up front, is that we couldn't enter into a free trade agreement with Colombia or Peru because they didn't have that much to offer. Uh, in, in all of that. And it was Bob Zellick that came up with the idea of the Trade Preference Act, okay? And the Trade Preference Act said, we're going to open up our markets, okay, to a specific aspect for you uh, and, uh, so that you can benefit uh, and, and we'll, we'll see what kind of economic activity we can do. We opened up the rose market uh, to Colombia uh, and and, uh, and over a period of time, 70% of the roses in the United States came from Colombia, and they benefited huge from it. 
And that what led to the whole ability to enter into a free trade agreement with Colombia. Uh, and, and the rest is history. I mean, Colombia is growing at a, at a terrific rate. In Peru, uh, Trade Preference Act, we opened up the asparagus market uh, and, uh, to Peru. And they benefited big uh, and, you know, from that. That allowed us to enter into this U.S.-Peru uh, uh, free trade agreement. So as we start to expand uh, on this one uh, and, and grow, we have to be very aggressive on our trade agenda. And we need to see it go at a much faster pace uh, in, you know, in order to get the economic growth jobs and the peace and prosperity uh, part that you've seen. But today, we've got the most robust agenda uh, that we have ever had. Um, you brought up the Doha development agenda. It didn't work because of the disparities between a lot of countries and all of that. It will work, uh, all of that part. But what the WTO has done is broken it down in components. You know, again, as we all know that when you enter into a trade agreement, you're talking agriculture, manufactured goods, services, and trade facilitation. Uh, and so the WTO put out the leadership of the trade uh, facilitation first. Uh, on this one, which is all about cross-border activity, exports, uh, customs, processing, all of those kind of things. But we need to get it ratified, and please, again, any help that you can do with your government to, uh, you know, to get ratification would be great. But we now have an international trade agreement on services, first time. And again, as we said before, manufacturing was here, services were here. It's the other way around now. So we've got to get after the services, and the fact that the WTO has put it on the table, along with the uh, information technology, agreement uh, is is huge we will pass probably and I'm, I shouldn't say a timeline because you know then you know you know you know what do you know uh, type thing but in six weeks you know somewhere there I think we're going to get uh, the trans-pacific partnership done uh, I'm, I'm sorry to say that uh, trade promotion authority in the United States is holding it up uh, but it's passed the Senate and it'll pass the house soon uh, and, and and then uh, trans-pacific partnership will get done but a, as exciting as that is that is 12 countries uh, in, on that one and there are certain countries like Korea Indonesia Philippines that aren't in it that are going to be negatively impacted and we got to get them in so this is just a starting point on that one and with China hosting the G20 next year. Uh, China is not in it and is not pre playing a, a leadership role. And we've got to help be a part of a process that allows China to take on that leadership uh, and, and to get uh, that in. And then you've got the transatlantic and, you know, and uh, all of those kind of things. But I come back. Uh, and, and Jim's comment. Uh, to me, trade and investment in the whole world of trade is the most critical path for all of us to get to the growth and jobs that we need. Uh, and, and if we're doing more together and we're creating win-win uh, situations, not win-lose uh, on that part, we are going to be the beneficiaries of a much better world and we can get after a lot of the things that we were hearing uh, the last couple days uh, about poverty and inequality and all of those kind of nasty things that we want to solve, uh, but you can do it through the basis of trade. Thank you so much, Terry. Thank you for those uh, inspiring words, Terry. Whenever we speak of global trade in the 21st century, there is the assumption on the part of some people that we're speaking about uh, opportunities solely for large multinational corporations. The truth is uh, far from that. The fact of the matter is that the ICC represents millions of small and medium-sized companies, and one of the new facts of international trade in the 21st century is that small and medium-sized enterprises worldwide are engaging for the first time fully in import and export through trade. Uh, they are doing so uh, through these global value chains that characterize our new century. Uh, one of my other former colleagues from the WTO, Arancha Gonzalez, is here with us today. This is her specialty now. Uh, she is uh, heading up the International Trade Center 
that is doing so much to facilitate further engagement by SMEs in world trade, and I want to recognize her now to uh, tell us more about all uh, that is being done and should be done uh, to assist SMEs. Grazie. Uh, Jim e grazie a Torino per questa bella ospitalità, soprattutto qui in questo posto magico dell'ingotto. It's true that we talk a lot about trade in the 21st century and we think fragmentation of production and we think services uh, and we think non-tariff barriers and we think emerging countries, but we don't talk and do enough about the real game changer in the 21st century called small and medium enterprises. Some figures to put this in a context. 90% of firms in any country from the US to Italy, from Burkina Faso to Bangladesh are SMEs. 60% of the employment in every country is SMEs. Half of the SMEs are women owned. Half of these SMEs have huge impact on youth employment. SMEs have, in general, lower productivity than larger firms and have lower wages than larger firms. So this is the backdrop of the problem, or rather the challenge we have, in my view, for trade in the 21st century, which is how do we leverage the SMEs to be the vector of inclusive growth? Now, some good news. SMEs that participate in international trade are more productive than those that don't participate in international trade. And productivity, we know, equals better wages, and better wages equals better societies. So, our challenge is how can we help more SMEs become international? We used to call it exporting, but it's no longer about just exporting. It's about exporting and importing, and it is about importing and exporting investment. This is why we in the International Trade Center like to talk about how can we help SMEs internationalize. And how can we do this the elegant way so that these SMEs are not trapped at the bottom of the value chain is the big question uh, we've been grappling with in the ITC in the last 50 years. So here are some ideas. I'll put six briefly on the table of what SMEs are telling us are crucial ingredients for them to be a more vibrant part of the international economy. The first one they always tell us is called trade and market intelligence. They need to know where are the opportunities. And they tell us this is the single most important factor for them to internationalize. The second is access to credit. If there is no capital, there is no way these SMEs are going to internationalize. And here, uh, obviously, uh, we have uh, Intesa San Paolo, uh, who can talk about this with much more authority than the International Trade Center can. Three, it's quality, quality, quality. No quality, no internationalization. It's being able to meet international, public quality standards, but more and more it's about meeting private standards. Those that are set not by governments, those that are set by companies, by businesses. For it's about accessing foreign markets. It's about being able to import for your exports. Again, it's not just about exporting. Half of what, uh, more than half of what companies export today are in reality process input products. Fifth is about getting to markets, and this is called logistics. And this is why it's so important that we help the WTO members ratify the trade facilitation agreement. 
It's for SMEs, this trade facilitation agreement is the difference between remaining locked in smaller domestic markets or being able to participate in larger international markets. So we must do everything we can. You must uh, help as much as you can in making sure we get this trade facilitation uh, agreement up and running ASAP. Final element is about being for SMEs being forward-looking. It's called innovation. We heard Mayor Fasino talk about innovation and how Torino and uh, uh, this part of Italy is doing it. It's extremely important to remain ahead of the curve. Now, Jim, briefly, what does this require? First, it requires the trade policy to focus on r the real obstacles to trade in the 21st century. Let me tell you what SMEs tell us are the real obstacles to trade in the 21st century. They are called non tariff barriers. They are called services. They need efficient, well-functioning, open services markets. Three, they need trade facilitation to become a reality as soon as we can. Obviously, SMEs require good business environments. We've heard about this all morning. I'll not duel on that. Finally, what SMEs are telling us they need is a strong trade and investment support institutions, strong institutions, strong chambers of commerce that are going to help them move international. This is where chambers have a huge role to play. And uh, let me mention two areas where chambers have a huge role to play. Of course, the six menu that I've given, but giving it digitally, it's no longer about paper, it's now about digital, digital virtual marketplaces, digital signatures, digital customs, digital contracts. It's about better exploiting the world of digital and it's about better exploiting the crowdfunding uh, uh, space, which in my view, it's important for many SMEs. Now, a bit of a commercial to finish, Jim. Obviously, uh, the International Trade Center has been partner of uh, Chambers of Commerce for over 50 years. We hope to be even better partners uh, in the 50 years to come. Uh, an up it, an, a bit of a taste of this, uh, go to booth number 18, 18, where my colleagues will be able to uh, give you all you need to know to support uh, SMEs internationalized, to help uh, those uh, that are uh, maybe not uh, able to do that by themselves with the big aid for trade agenda that is available with the enhanced integrated framework that is available for least developed countries please tap into these resources they are yours to help SMEs internationalize thank you thank you uh, Arantxa she too made a number of points that uh, deserve entire sessions. One point she made, I want to make certain that you heard, is that uh, for SMEs, for all, trade is not just about exports. Trade is about imports. Uh, in fact, any economist uh, would uh, tell you that the purpose of engaging in trade is to import. Perhaps more on that later. Uh, our next uh, speaker is the very distinguished uh, Vice Chairman of uh, the International Chamber of Commerce, um, Suni Mittal, who, who uh, also just happens to be one of the leading uh, business executives in India. Uh, he uh, is going to uh, t expand on what we've already heard by telling us uh, about uh, a number of aspects of services and digital trade as it relates to SMEs and their engagement uh, in uh, trade in the 21st century through these global value changes, especially in India. Mr. Vice Chairman. Thank you, James. Uh, very good morning to all of you. I'm delighted to build on what's already been uh, spoken by Ms. Gonzalez here about the SMEs and the global value chain and how the new uh, worldwide ecosystem is developing. Having been an SME myself for half of my working life, uh, I know the pains that an SME has to go through in building its business, coming up to a level of being recognized, 
not only within his community and uh, in the domestic market, but importantly, trying to seek access to the global markets. There have been profound changes out there which are today giving tremendous tailwinds to the SMEs of today as compared to where my life was 20 years back. Let me uh, set the context. Uh, today, uh, nearly 80% of the global trade moves through one form or the other of global value chain. SMEs are contributing about 40 to 50% in their global value chain. And the third fact that I want to uh, build my case on is that over 2.7 billion people are today connected to internet and are actively using it. And this number is increasing by the day, by the hour, mostly coming out of less developed countries, emerging markets, India, Africa, and many other weaker economies of the world. I think there will be, uh, probably in not too distant future, almost everybody in the world will be connected to the internet in one form or shape. Large part, in particular, in the emerging world, the internet uh, experience is coming through a mobile device rather than a traditional fixed device. That's the another factor that we need to keep in mind. Now, all this is revolutionizing the way SMEs are used to do trade and are going to do trade in the future. Today, almost every SME anywhere in the globe, and I work in very deep rural parts of uh, sub-Saharan Africa, people are connecting through internet to export their wares across the globe. 92% of commercial sales on eBay today are exported, 92%. 80% of those are in multi-countries. So today, SMEs, which were required earlier to knock on the doors of embassies, go into trade fairs, set up meetings in a very difficult environment, getting visas, travel restrictions, are today sitting in their home and are accessing the world markets. 90% and above are exporting their wares through eBay, for example. And similarly, the other platforms um, uh, which are competing with eBay, which are allowing similar activities. There's a massive amount of disintermediation happening across the globe today. In our times, the global supply chain constituted large pieces of physical movements. Today, logistics have become more, much more efficient. Physical movements have been cut down to the delivery part only. And most of the sales, uh, most of the uh, process of trade from one point to other is all happening digitally. Most of you are aware of uh, the new digital platforms that are coming through. Uh, if I may give you one or two examples, Airbnb is one such example. Many of you may be using it. What does that mean for the large SME of world trades, which is dependent on travel agency type of business, hotel booking, travel booking, they are under serious disintermediation today. Music industry, the effect it has having on studios today, having on people who are producing cassettes, CDs, is very profound as we all know. In fact, with the launch of Apple's streaming services last week, I think we are going to see a major shift now moving decisively towards music being consumed only in one fashion, and that will be through streaming on mobile and other devices. That has profound effects on uh, many industries, but importantly today, the SMEs who are in the music trade are no more going to be at the mercy of many of the people who are part of that old value chain. Suddenly, they are going to be talking to the customers directly by way of small apps, mostly on mobile devices. The third example uh, that comes to my mind straight away is the financial piece. A large part of uh, SME's cost structures sit through large banking channels. Uh, we just heard about crowdfunding as well, and I'll come to that in a moment because there are certain cross-border issues there which we need to deal with, and maybe Ms. Gonzalez will be able to help us through the uh, deliberations today how to deal with that. But we are now looking at payment mechanism, payment systems, which are providing the same services as large banks at a fraction of a cost. Even today, whether it's Western Union moving monies from uh, one part of the world to another, or going through a mobile app, which are coming through in all shapes and uh, forms, 
the differences between charging for a 1,000 pound remittance from UK to India from a 30, 40 pound uh, cost down to the same uh, level of transfers being done at perhaps less than one pound. That's the kind of effect that is having on SME's ability to price itself, to uh, improve its margin, and be relevant to the markets. SMEs today need to focus on one thing, and that was mentioned earlier, quality, quality, and quality. The rest, you will be picked up, you will be taken to the global marketplace by one platform or the other, and the cost of moving your bookings, your orders, and the financial costs are going to be marginal of what you're paying today. So all looks uh, pretty good and robust. What are the problems? I think problems are uh, a few and very important problems. First and foremost today is cybersecurity and privacy. When I talk to many of the people who are moving from physical supply chain to digital supply chain, this is one of the foremost concerns on people's mind. Are we going to have our security on um, uh, uh, the digital world secure? Are we going to ensure that our prices are kept uh, in private uh, silos and not be distributed to our competitors? And of course, the uh, digital signature that has been just spoken about, contracts and they are built in the digital world need to have the sanctity of law and need to be very well understood and importantly simplified for the benefit of SMEs. I think this is one area where uh, we can, through this forum, urge the, uh, all the stakeholders, in particular the commerce ministries and the governments of various uh, countries, to start focusing in this area, how to ensure that when the trade happens on the digital chain, it is secure, privacy uh, laws are intact, and importantly, uh, the contract uh, uh, verification and its validity is well established. I think the other part, given that most of the SMEs are going to be dependent on mobile devices, the management of spectrum, the investment of networks, this is one area which is uh, where I personally um, work a lot, are extremely important. If you have to roll out networks, especially in the suburban, rural, deep rural areas, it's important that the countries recognize the importance of a mobile broadband infrastructure for which both spectrum, uh, local laws, local levies and duties, and importantly, investment climate to put uh, such investments in the rural, rural areas is extremely important. That, I would say, is the second uh, most important part that needs to be in place for the world to uh, seamlessly uh, use the digital uh, global value chain. The third important part would be the IPR protection and the crowdfunding, I would say. Now, SMEs have now access to new forms of raising capital. But unfortunately, uh, those who are sitting in sub-Saharan Africa or rural parts of India need to have access to a global crowdfunding activities. There are restrictions today which do not allow easy flow of crowdfunding cross on a cross-border basis. And I would say last but not the least, when the WTO um, gets into the final round of services agreement around the globe, one area where less developed countries, principally led by India and some African countries which have very young population, will seek out free movement of people. I think that will become one more uh, issue to be debated and discussed, which will be very important for uh, ensuring a sound and sane uh, global trade environment. I am very optimistic about uh, where the world is moving on the strength of digital value chain. What I uh, suffered as a small, medium enterprise in my first 20 years, my children are uh, clearly not suffering that, not only on account of them being part of now a richer, wealthier family, but one of my son, for example, is completely independently driving his business, and I see how he's running his business is completely different from how we ran our businesses. It's 100% based on digital platform. It is 100% based on internet connection with its customers. There is really no intermediation. There is no physical value chain at all. That's one form of business. And he is already making a great success of that. I am very confident that the world is going to benefit tremendously through the digital uh, global value chain that is being uh, created by many of the technology companies on the strength of a robust, fair, and transparent internet. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Sunil. Our vice chairman has, uh, in the breadth of his discussion, underscored one important point we would all want you to realize about global trade in the 21st century. Uh, trade is no longer solely about customs and tariffs and things that happen down at the port. Yes, it's still about all that, but the range of what trade covers, and especially investment as a part of the flip side of trade, uh, extends far beyond that. The WTO uh, now has, for example, under the WTO treaty, jurisdiction over more than 95 percent of all global commerce, either that is engaging in international trade or is affected by international trade. Of course, if small and medium enterprises want to be a part of global value chains and engage in trade, uh, they need the finance with which to do it. Um, so they need a banker. Um, Italians uh, had a lot to do with inventing banking, and they still have what we call in trade a comparative advantage in international financial services. Uh, here is an expression of that comparative advantage as one of our panelists. Uh, uh, we're very pleased to have here uh, the chairman of Intesa Sao Paulo Bank, Gian Maria Gross Pietro, to tell us uh, something about what's happening in terms of trade finance for small and medium-sized enterprises that want to be part of these global value chains. John. Thank you, James, for the opportunity of uh, exposing the point of view of a bank. Uh, you know, the banks are happy when their, their clients are in a good shape. And this is not exactly the situation at the world level today. Uh, the global economy has expanded at a moderate and uneven pace during 2014. And uh, this year, we expect uh, a, a stronger uh, growth, especially in advanced economies, but weaker in emerging markets, uh, especially in some large emerging markets, uh, and oil exporter. The International Monetary Fund, the OECD, the United Nations estimate that uh, the, this year growth rate will be between uh, 3 and 4 percent, even if recently we have had uh, some revision upwards of the expectations. Uh, but uh, if you look not at the growth of uh, the GDP, of the, the global GDP, but to the trade, to export, you, you read a different story. Uh, because uh, the growth of international trade and uh, of merchandise trade has been uh, more, uh, more rapid. And uh, uh, countries which were, uh, uh, were basing their gr growth uh, more on exports and imports as well, uh, then on internal demand uh, have had a better growth, a higher growth, uh, also the United States. Uh, and if you look at the global uh, volume, uh, this has bounced back on a steady positive trend starting in 2009 and uh, in 2011 uh, we were already surpassing the pre-crisis level. So the bank intermediated trade finance has increased substantially. Trade finance transactions are a good uh, uh, affair for the banks because uh, they have a, a lower probability of default, a lower expected loss, loss respect to other type of banking transactions that are a, a, a safe business. But if you look at the SMEs, these are to be aware that there are costs involved with expanding into new markets. <coughs> these costs are proportionally much greater for SMEs than for large firms. So credit is playing a role, an important role, on supporting export activities of the SMEs. Because these are facing uh, credit in, more credit-intensive activity, 
longer productive cycles and higher risks. But from the point of view of the bank, exporting enterprises are in general among the happy few because they have higher productivity, higher cash flow, lower leverage, and so they are, generally speaking, good clients for the banks. But they face many challenges in accessing capital. Given their size, limited assets, and general inability to raise funds through credit markets or publicly traded equity. That is the problem. So banks provide support for the internalization of SMEs via credit, release of guarantees, advisory and information services. In fact, globally, about uh, between seven and eight trillion dollars of bank intermediated trade finance was providing during the last year for which we have data, that is 2011. That is about a third of global trade. The remainder was financed by inter-firm trade credit. But in inter-firm trade credit entails lower fees and more flexibility than trade finance from one side, and on the other side leaves firms bearing more payment risks, potentially greater need for working capital. So the, uh, the bank are uh, fundamental for the expansion of the activity of trade that uh, as uh, international trade, as uh, uh, Senora Gonzalez was telling before, uh, is a large part a, a, a substantial part, a, a, the largest part of the international trade. So what are doing the banks? Uh, the banks are moving from the traditional activity that is a, a reactive approach, uh, providing advisory financing, credit letters, guarantees, customer clearance services, uh, to a proactive approach that is to encourage SMEs to export and also to import in order to, to get efficiency, uh, lower prices or lower costs. So uh, w which are the, the new uh, services which are supplied by the bank uh, into the proactive approach? Uh, one has been already mentioned, the supply chain finance. That is Im important, really Im important uh, because uh, uh, when you make credit, not to a single firm, but to a supply chain, you reduce the risk uh, which is connected with a single firm, and uh, you reduce also the costs of providing credit. Th that is the cost of measuring the credit merit of the single firm. Uh, the other one has been already mentioned, that is d digitalizing the, the activity. That is fundamental uh, for the access of the SMEs to the international markets. Uh, because the costs of digi digitalized uh, trade is uh, lower and uh, there are less scale economies than in the traditional trade. So this is the, the real door by which uh, SMEs can access international trade. Uh, I, I would uh, conclude uh, by saying that uh, um, the new regulation on the banking activity at the world level uh, is uh, not in favor of SMEs. That is a real problem. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the Basel III uh, regulation uh, at present has not yet produced a, a, a very severe constraint on the financing of SMEs. But in progress, we can see more and more obstacles uh, to provide credit to SMEs because uh, it is difficult uh, to, uh, or, or more difficult for SMEs, uh, to define uh, credit merit and uh, the weight of the credit provided to SMEs as a, a higher 
weight is higher than the weight of the credit provided to large uh, firms. That is a, a problem that uh, we uh, have to face also in, in Europe, and especially in Europe, I should say. We, we are uh, the fifth largest bank in the Eurozone and one of the best capitalized, but uh, we have uh, to pay attention and to be very cautious in expanding credit to SMEs under the present regulation. So what I would conclude by saying that uh, uh, governments and uh, uh, regulation, uh, regulatory authorities uh, should consider very, uh, with high attention, the, uh, the uh, evolution, the, the further evolution of regulations uh, with a special attention to the position of the SMEs. Thank you so much. As Terry McGraw mentioned uh, at the outset today, uh, the ICC uh, represents uh, more than six million different companies worldwide in 130 different national chapters. Uh, a great many are represented in this audience uh, this, this morning. So the ICC is engaged in all kinds of global endeavors uh, to try to advance uh, the business agenda for global uh, growth and sustainable growth. And one of them is the uh, G20, the group of uh, 20 leading economies uh, that meets from time to time and uh, uh, tries to uh, provide some additional uh, impetus yeah, for moving the Turkey. world forward. Uh, Terry yeah. and I have the uh, privilege of serving. He is chair and me as one of his lieutenants on the uh, B20, the Business 20 that advises the G20 on trade investment and related international economic issues. So we are having an entire session this afternoon at 4 o'clock uh, on the B20 leading up to the next B20 summit uh, this fall in, in Turkey. Uh, our our uh, friends from Turkey are in charge of this particular summit and have been doing a great job. Uh, as an extra added attraction uh, on this uh, panel, uh, we have here the, uh, uh, the B20 chair from Turkey, uh, uh, Rifat, who will tell us a little bit about this in preview of this session, and uh, uh, I'm sure you'll want to uh, uh, hold your detailed questions uh, on the B20 for this afternoon. Rifat. Thank, thanks, James, dear friends. It's a pleasure to be here at the opening plenary of the Ninth World Chambers Congress. As TOBB, we have hosted the Fifth World Chambers Congress in 2007, and I know how important it is. I am a part of the Chambers Network for almost 30 years, and I am always proud to be a member of this family. But this year is a spe special year for us. As you know, Turkey is leading the G20 this year. And I have been appointed as the B20 chair. As the president of the Turkish Chambers Union, TOBB, this is a real honor for me and for the chamber system. Because for the first time, a chamber is leading the B20. This is very important. As chambers, we should be more effective in global policy making. And we have to show that we are, we, we are, very, we are pr policy relevant. We have to show that we are not only local, but we have also the capacity to act global. G20 is the leading global policy making platform, and B20 is the voice of the business in this platform. ICC is an integral part of this platform, and we are working really hard to make ICC more and more effective in B20. Terry, John, Sunil, and all ICC team is supporting us a lot. We are grateful to them. 
but as national and local chambers, we have to support ICC in these efforts. For this reason, as B20 Turkey, we are working a lot to have more and more chambers and local businesses active in B20. We, we became a bigger family this year. In previous years, B20 has around 300 companies, uh, multinational companies. Now we have around 700 members from all around the world. Now we have we almost tripled our membership from the emerging G20 countries. This is a real success for the B20. It has been only six months since the B20 kickoffs event in December. Our task forces started the policy development process in February, when the first finance ministers' meetings was held in Istanbul. Since then, we, ha we held regional consultations in Saudi Arabia, twice in Singapore, in India, in Azerbaijan, and in Brazil. First, the trade task force, which is co-chaired by Terry, is pushing to speed up trade globally. And we are very closely following the footsteps of the World Trade Agenda initiative of the ICC. I believe trade is more critical than it has ever been. But the health of the global trading system is far from perfect. Moreover, protectionism is rising and trade is slowing down. The B20 Trade Task Force was, has worked this year to develop recommendations to address this problem. Terry mentions, mentioned uh, most of these. Most critically, the task force calls on all governments to ratify the trade facilitation agreement by the Nairobi Ministerial WTO meeting. Moreover, the task force also calls on all governments to continue the G20 standstill commitment on protectionist measures and to roll back. We are especially focusing on limiting the localization measures, which are on the rise. Additionally, we are currently working on a third recommendation to include to our list. This is very relevant to this point that Sunil raised. But in this new recommendation, the B20 asks for improving the global trade system for the emerging digital economy. Digital economy is becoming a more and more important part of our life. But G20 did not work on this very much. In previous G20 communiques, you cannot even see any internet word or any mention to digital economy. For this reason, we believe such a recommendation will impact global trade on a large scale because digital economy is expect, ex expected to contribute $4 trillion in 2016 and it is growing around 10% a year. But trade task force is not only trade task force that we support trade and investment agenda. This year, the B20, we give special importance to the SMEs. And as a part of the responsibility of chambers to their members, we have established a new task force, the SMEs and Entrepreneurship Task Force. As Arancha also mentioned, this task force believes that there is a need for SMEs to become better integrated into global markets. As we all know, SMEs have been nef negatively affected by unintended results of regulation over the past few years. They need our help. They are the job creators of the global economy. We cannot take our eyes off them. 
So we are developing brand new recommendations for them. Moreover, I am proud to announce that two weeks ago, the World SME Forum was officially formed as an advocacy arm for SMEs. This will be another victory for the B20 and for the chambers globally. As ICC, TOBB, WCF, as the founding members of the World SME Forum, we want to invite you all of you be a member and partner of the World SME Forum. Please come and join us and advance SMEs globally. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to take me too long to describe all B20 recommendations in detail. This afternoon, as uh, James mentioned, at 4 p.m., we will have a special session on B20 issues in the Madrid room. Please come and join us and be a part of the B20 process. This consultation is not limited to the G20 countries because business is global. So you are all welcome. Moreover, I hope to see you upcoming B20 events. We will meet in September at the B20 conference in Ankara. We will deliver our recommendations to the G20 finance ministers. And in November, we will meet with our government leaders at the Antalya summit. We want to see more chambers in these forums to show that as chambers, we are global players. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Some of us will be privileged to uh, be in